Hey, welcome to another edition of the Nonprofit Leadership Studio. Another great guest tonight. Uh, we have uh, Mary Lawler, who is the head of the uh, Avenue CDC, the Community Development Corporation uh, here in Houston. Mary, thanks so much for being here in the class and on this program. Thank you for having me. Yeah. So um, we're talking about leadership today. And I always point to you as one of the great leaders of the nonprofit world in Houston. Mm -hmm. uh, Let's say that you're writing a book, Mary, on leadership. What are some of the key components, some of the key chapters, some of the things that you would write about? Mm -hmm. Well, um, so I'm not writing a book, but I have right. read a great book on leadership um, called The Leadership Challenge uh, uh -huh. by, I think it's Kuznis and Posner. Um, Posner, yeah. Yep. And uh, it's a terrific book, which I would uh, highly recommend. Um, and... Uh, you know, some of the things that it talks about are, uh, first of all, to uh, be a good role model uh, for people who you work with. Um, so uh, really uh, walking the walk um, to um, inspire a vision uh, that people can follow, to um, let people contribute uh, themselves to um, achieving that vision and to, um, you know, really rewarding the heart, uh, recognizing people for their contributions. And, and the success that you have had and that your organization, the Avenue CDC, has had is, is really somewhat extraordinary, right? Is, is this a matter of you having the right people on the bus, great employees mm -hmm. and good leadership? Or is it also a matter of some happenstance in terms of the neighborhood which you were the CDC, where the CDC was based? Well, I think first of all, um, the, the one of the foundational things for any nonprofit is the board of trustees. Mm -hmm. um, so Avenue CDC has a terrific board of uh, volunteers who are very dedicated to our mission um, and uh, who work very hard uh, mm -hmm. to support me as the executive director um, so that I can uh, then, then support our staff. So, um, so the board is key. Um, and then, of course, having the right team um, on the staff uh, is, is another uh, really important aspect. Um, you know, I would definitely say that we as an organization have been um, fortunate mm -hmm. um, with some opportunities that we've had, uh, with some funders who have had faith in us, mm -hmm. um, and that that has contributed to our success as well. When I look at the neighborhood, the first neighborhood that you developed, right, Washington mm -hmm. Avenue neighborhood, um, there was a day when, when that was, I, I remember telling someone I was going to take the member of our board, mm -hmm. uh, he was the president of Kroger, and he had just moved back to town. And I said, I'm going to take you to lunch at a restaurant on Washington Avenue. Mm -hmm. And he'd spent many years in Kroger before growing up here in Houston, before going up to Cincinnati. He says, well, that's a bad neighborhood, Bob. I don't believe mm -hmm. that there's a good restaurant there. And we went there and went to Catalan at the time, mm -hmm. and it was a great restaurant. Uh, but he was amazed at the neighborhood. And it seems to me from an outsider looking in, that it was all because of the Avenue CDC and the work that you guys were doing. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, what, what, what was it that, that sort of made it work for you guys? Well, when Avenue CDC was founded, the mission um, and the vision of the organization was to improve the community while preserving the diversity of that mm -hmm. neighborhood. Um, the the neighborhood where we were founded, the the old Sixth Ward community and, and the Washington Avenue area, you know, is very close to Houston's downtown. It um, had a lot of potential, but it had really been uh, very neglected and sort of um, had fallen into uh, you know hard times yeah. uh, with a lot of the the housing stock and businesses, etc. So I mean, I really think that there was a kind kind of a synergy of you mm -hmm. know opportunity for us um, at, at, at a time when that neighborhood was poised to take off. Yeah. And so we were able to get in there and develop some affordable housing, both uh, for sale for, for first time home buyers, as well as some rental housing. Yep. And, uh, you know, the neighborhood has changed, I mean, completely. It's amazing. Uh, yeah. 
It's like your work is done there almost, right? <laughs> well, and honestly, it's very hard for us to do any more affordable housing there, given yeah. the kind of subsidy levels that are available. So we did, um, about 15 years ago, we expanded our target area to include the near north side neighborhood, uh, so right here where UHD is yeah. and then to the north of here, and that's where we are primarily focusing right now. I, re I remember... Um, a number of years ago, and I was with you, and maybe you relayed this, or maybe this is your thing, but the, the, you said the minute that the that the uh, target opened up in the neighborhood, it's like my work is done here. <laughs> you know, so yeah. we, we have developed the whole. So talk about what the Avenue CDC is and what a community development corporation is, mm -hmm. sort of a nutshell. You've, you've got on the elevator with me, uh -huh. and we're like, what is Avenue CDC? What are you saying? Okay, so we uh, build affordable homes and strengthen communities. Um, a CDC is a specific type of nonprofit organization that uh, generally focuses on housing development and economic development. So we build affordable single family homes and multifamily apartments. We provide uh, education to first time home buyers. And we work with residents on a whole array of community improvement efforts, such as um, enhancing safety in the community, beautifying the neighborhood. Um, even improving education where mm -hmm, we can and, mm -hmm. and improving the health care options available to our residents. And how long have you been at the Avenue CDC? I've been there for 19 years. Wow, wow. And you started like right out of elementary school. Something right? like so that, yeah. That for you. <laughs> um, and tell me a little bit about your background, though. Let's talk a little bit about mm -hmm. that. You grew up in New Jersey. I did, yes. Yeah. I grew up in New Jersey and uh, went to Duke University uh -huh. um, and uh, worked for a couple of years um, after uh, college, um, first as a newspaper reporter, actually. Oh, really? Um, Where was that? Where it, were you? Uh, in Brookline, Massachusetts. Yeah, right uh, outside of Boston. Exactly. Yeah. I was uh, working for a weekly, local weekly paper. And um, as a reporter, uh, my beat was to cover local government. So I would go to the city council meetings and I would go to the housing authority meetings. And uh, I did it for about a year and realized that I was sort of more interested in, in working in government and public service than, than being a reporter about it. Mm -hmm. And um, so I uh, then uh, got a job um, in New York City working for the mayor's office. Mm -hmm. uh, who was the mayor at the time? Mayor Koch. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, and how am I doing? Was that what he used to always say? How am I doing? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, he was doing pretty good. Yeah, he yeah. was a he mayor did, for a long well. time. Yeah. Um, so uh, worked in the mayor's office on homelessness, actually. The homeless problem is so severe in New York that even uh, then we had an office specifically dedicated to it and eventually a whole department dedicated mm. to homelessness. Um, so I... Uh, worked there for a couple of years before I went to graduate school. Mm -hmm. And and you went to Harvard for graduate school, the Kennedy School. Mm -hmm. uh, so for three weeks in a row, we've had like a Kennedy School person here. It's ah. sort of interesting. Yeah. <laughs> and um, and then right out of the Kennedy School, where did you go? So I uh, actually went and worked for a consulting company uh, for a brief period. Uh, did not like that. Mm. Which consulting company? <laughs> ICF. Uh -huh. um, they basically uh, were on contract with uh, HUD, with the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, to write um, manuals about how to um. expend federal funds. And I was sort of in a windowless office yeah. writing uh, government manuals fun. and yeah. did not... Did not enjoy that, so I went back to um, New York um, to take on a, a different uh, position uh, with a new mayor at that point, mm. um, and then uh, and then eventually made my way down here to Houston. And your first job in Houston was it at the Avenue CDC? It was. It wow. was. And, I, did, and you came in as the executive director. I did. Yes. And what did what did the Avenue? What did the organization look like at the time? So when I was hired, I was the first full-time mm. um, staff member. Mm -hmm. um, and so we uh, were very small. We had a very small budget. I think our entire budget was $50,000. Wow. Um, that was all your was, salary. Which was my salary and all the supplies and et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> And um, I actually uh, had an office at, um, at another nonprofit uh, called MECA, Multicultural oh, sure. Education and Counseling Through the Arts. 
Um, they have a uh, former school building where uh, they're located, and so I had a classroom on the second floor mm -hmm. uh, was our office, and uh, eventually was able to sort of hire a part-time person and then a full-time person, and, and we've grown uh, from there. Are you a really good fundraiser, Mary, that, that you were able to, to be a one-person office to mm -hmm. go to where you are today? I think that fundraising is definitely one of my strengths, um, that, uh, you know, uh, writing grant proposals and uh, following up with funders and, and finding those opportunities was definitely invaluable in the early years. Wow. And um, as you've seen your organization grow to you, to now 25 people, and just the impact that you have is so immense. When you reflect back on the 19 years mm -hmm. uh, that you've been the leader of the MDCDC, what was a low point for you? What was, mm -hmm. where was the real leadership challenge for you? Mm -hmm. So I would say that we've had um, a couple of really challenging um, real estate transactions mm. um, where, uh, you know, it, uh, one, uh, of our difficulties was sort of a partnership with another nonprofit that went south mm. <laughs> and wow. uh, and was very difficult uh, to navigate. Um, and another was uh, just a project which, you know, we had invested a lot of time and money into, um, which, uh, y you know, really became very difficult to, uh, to complete. So those were, I would say, some of my low points. A lot of nonprofits um, at one point got a lot of money from Enron, mm -hmm. and then Enron went south. Were you one of the organizations that got a lot of money from Enron? We were not. Oh. We were not. I remember. In retrospect, it's lucky, I think, <laughs> when, you, when you're not one of those. Right? Well, I remember something interesting about Enron, which was at some point they got a whole bunch of nonprofits in a room to talk about um, enterprise capital. And I remember sitting in the room thinking, whatever they're talking about, it does not make sense to me. I mm. don't understand this. And, um, and, and then, you know, the company failed shortly thereafter. And I thought, well, maybe, maybe it wasn't me. <laughs> maybe it was them. <laughs> <laughs> maybe they weren't the smartest guys in the room. Right? Yeah. yeah. Um, and when you think about your high point, uh, mm -hmm. was it when the target opened on mm -hmm. Washington Avenue? Or when was the high point? Uh, and what has been the high point for you so far? You know, I think um, we have a couple, uh, well, let me just step back and say that one of the really uh, great things about the type of work that I do is that you can really see your work. I mean, it's right there. You can yeah. see it, and that's very satisfying. So, um, you know, you uh, there's the little things like when uh, somebody buys their first home and they're getting the keys and they're so excited, and, um, you know, that's really rewarding on a personal level. Mm -hmm. um, but there's also the uh, the real estate projects, which we have a couple of great projects going on right now that I'm, I'm very proud of. Um, and, you know, I can, I can take you there and show you and you can see them. Yeah. And, you know, that's exciting to me. You've been there 19 years. You know, I get calls all the time from places that want to hire me away. You must mm -hmm. get tons of calls mm -hmm. with your success. Are you ever tempted mm -hmm. to, to do something different? I uh, really love my job. Um, it never gets dull. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you would think after 19 years that you'd be doing the same old thing again and again, and that does not happen in, in my job. There are always um, new opportunities and new challenges, and it, it never gets dull for me. Wow. When, when you see other nonprofits around town, and you and I see a lot of nonprofits, and we partner with many, and um, and it seems to me, I see a lot that have a lot of potential. Mm -hmm. Is it many times sort of the lack of leadership at other organizations? I mean, how important mm -hmm. is leadership to the success of nonprofits around Houston and around the country? Uh, you know, you can't underestimate the importance of leadership. Um, it, uh, you know, it, you do see some groups that lack that direction, yeah. that are, um, you know, not sure where they're going. Maybe they're just chasing the next grant or, um, you know, foundering in some way or another because of lack of, of leadership or lack of skill to carry through mm -hmm. on a vision. Um, and, and that's really a shame. So, um, you know, again, I think the board is where it starts. Um, and then uh, and then a leader uh, of the staff is, is 
is, is the next uh, thing that's important. Mm -hmm. Wow. And as you look around town at the landscape of nonprofits, mm -hmm. who are some of the high performing mm -hmm. nonprofits in, in your mind? Well, um, you know, one of uh, the organizations that I really admire, and it's not just because they're one of our funders, but um, I think that they're a really great group is Local Initiative Support Corporation, oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, which is an intermediary organization um, that does support uh, other community development groups like ours. And, um, you know, they really are, uh, I think, visionary in terms of uh, getting new models uh, for our work uh, to Houston and, and helping other organizations to carry those out. So um, that's certainly Lisk. one example. Yes, yeah, yeah. Houston Lisk. We, we've invited Amanda to come to, to, to be here in the class, yeah. Great. Who else? Great. Well, you know, then, um, of course, there's the, the, big, the big one. There's yep. neighborhood centers, yeah. um, which uh, I think, you know, what's amazing about neighborhood centers is just the breadth of things that they are doing um, here in Houston. I mean, they um, have a, such a wide array of programs. Um, they're using uh, so many different funding sources to make all those things happen. Um, they do have a place-based approach, which you know we think is uh, very important to changing lives and communities. So I would say they're another good example. Mm -hmm. What are some of the biggest mistakes that you see nonprofit leaders make? <clears throat> well, I, I do think that it's important to keep your eye on, on the mission and mm -hmm. not to uh, allow mission creep to take you away and from... And explain mission creep, because you may be the first... We talk a lot of, about it a lot in the nonprofit world, but I think you may be the first person to bring it up. So yeah. talk about mission creep. Well, I mean, it, it can be uh, due to chasing funds. Um, mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, you can be uh, doing X and doing it very well, and then and a funder announces a, uh, a funding opportunity over here and you think, well, that is, you know, related to what we do or is something that we could do and you go and chase those dollars and suddenly you are um, perhaps not meeting your mission as well and are going off in a direction that you may not have a core strength in. Mm -hmm. So I think that that uh, is a real risk um, that, uh, you know, that's not to say that you have to only do one thing and um, that there are certainly examples of, of groups like neighborhood centers yeah. that does a variety of things well, but you have to make sure that you are um, supporting an, a new initiative with, uh, you know, the staffing, the expertise, uh, the funding to make it a success. Neighborhood centers is almost an example of ple people who do mission creep well, huh? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, in a sense, I mean, I yeah. hate to admit it, but yeah. Any other big mistakes that uh, you see nonprofits do? Well, you definitely um, need to have a, a good handle on your finances. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, for an organization like ours, especially that's doing a lot of uh, real estate, um, our finances are pretty complicated. Uh, mm -hmm. We don't have uh, a lot of uh, predictable income or expenses. Um, and uh, so we have a very... Um, a uh, highly um, complex cash flow projection tool yeah. that we use to make sure that we are not getting ahead of ourselves, overextending ourselves. I mean, this gets more into the management side of things, yeah, but yeah, that's okay. it's yeah, important. Yeah. Is, is this something, have you guys had uh, tough times sometimes or, or mm -hmm. stressful times because of sort of managing money? Because I see that happen with nonprofits quite often. Yeah, I think what we have seen is uh, some, some big groups uh, elsewhere in the country completely flame out and go under. Yeah. And, and these are groups that, you know, from the outside you thought that is a strong, yep. healthy organization. It's been around for 25, 50 years. Um, it's an institution and then suddenly, phew, they're gone. It doesn't take much. I mean, yeah. we've seen that all over the country as well. Some other groups, uh, children's advocacy groups that are partners with us and then all mm -hmm. of a sudden they, they've not managed their money well and then that's that's that. Uh, let me go to the Twitterverse and let's start asking mm -hmm. uh, a few questions that are coming in here. Uh, let me start. Stephanie Bearfield, who always seems to ask the first question, uh, your housing only seems to be uh, centralized around uh, impoverished areas, not of value. 
that's your mission. Mm -hmm. is so our housing is around impoverished areas. Mm -hmm. So what we actually are doing um, is working in uh, primarily gentrifying neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. And uh, the big threat uh, that we see in the neighborhoods that we are working in is the potential displacement of low income people from communities that they want to stay in. So, you know, Washington Avenue being uh, the first neighborhood that we worked in. Um, and, you know, today the affordable apartments that we built on Washington are some of the last affordable apartments in that neighborhood. Um, currently, uh, we're working in the near north side, which is today a low-income neighborhood, but I bet if you come back there in 10 years, it will not be. And uh, the, the residents of that community are very committed to having affordable housing remain in the community mm -hmm. so that they can stay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Well, so that Christian Arnold has that question about gentrification. Is, is gentrification a good thing, a bad thing, or is mm -hmm. it just a thing that's happening? <laughs> you know, it's really both. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, I think people in low-income communities want their communities to improve. I think that um, there is room for people of higher income levels to move into low income neighborhoods, mm -hmm. these close in neighborhoods like near North Side, like Fifth Ward, like Third Ward. But what, uh, what we want is improvement without displacement. Mm -hmm. Again, getting back to you know people who have lived in these neighborhoods for uh, years or even generations should have an opportunity to stay in them as they improve. And are there examples around the country of uh, neighborhoods and cities that have gentrified, mm -hmm. but the people who lived there before gentrification are still living there and are pretty happy? Well, there are. Um, examples in process. So one that has been held out uh, as an example recently is the Tenderloin neighborhood in San Francisco, San Francisco yeah. where, um, you know, property values in San Francisco have gone through the roof. Uh, but in that neighborhood, a, a, a set of nonprofit organizations has succeeded in getting uh, control of a substantial portion of the land there. Mm -hmm. So the neighborhood will rise up in terms of values but affordable housing will will remain and that's what we're trying to accomplish in the near north side why is it that when you look around the city of houston there are a lot of cdc's it seems like mm -hmm. um, but but outside of the avenue it seems like most are relatively unsuccessful is it mm -hmm. is it uh, just a bad lot that has been for them, or what's the deal there? Well, first of all, there are many fewer than there used to be. Yeah, there's tons before. Yeah. <laughs> you know, six, six or eight years ago, there were probably uh, 50 CDCs in yeah. Houston, and now you'd probably have a hard time getting uh, 10 or more uh, mm -hmm. in a room. Um, but um, part of it is that Houston has not had as much of a tradition of support for CDCs as some other parts of the country. Mm. So, you know, New York, Chicago, Los Angeles uh, all have a uh, lot of uh, local support, government support for community development corporations, and Houston um, has not had that kind of a tradition. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good. Um, Christina Vogel wants to know, how do you, <clears throat> Mary, motivate uh, the board and, and the employees of the Avenue CDC? Mm -hmm. so, do you um, go out and give pep talks? To <laughs> Not exactly. Um, so the board, um, you know, our board is very active. Um, how, how big is your board? Fifteen. Oh, okay. We have fifteen members. Um, it uh, is made up uh, because we are a certain type of community development corporation known as a community housing development organization mm -hmm. or CHODO. Um, we have a requirement that one third of our board members either be uh, low income individuals or lo live in low income neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. um, so we do have um, income diversity on our board. We have um, diversity by professions. And um, we operate uh, our board uh, very much on a committee-based system. Mm -hmm. So each board member is um, on one or more committees, um, finance committee, the building committee, the fundraising committee, and each committee um, meets uh, once a month, and then our board meets every other month. 
And our board meetings are um, very much driven by the committee structure. So the committees will report on you know, the mm -hmm. work that they have done and any um, important uh, decisions will then be voted on by the board. Um, so it's very efficient and I think that the board members feel like their time is well used, it is not wasted, they are mm -hmm. making an important contribution. And so I think that's what inspires them, mm -hmm. is, is the feeling that they are not just there to fill a seat, but are really contributing to, um, to the cause. How often do you meet individually with your, your board members? I, I um, occasionally, but mm -hmm. most of my face-to-face -face meetings are in the form of the committee meetings. Mm -hmm. And how many times does your board meet? How often does your board meet? Six times a year. Okay, so yeah. not too bad. Mm -hmm. And are those lively occasions, or are they just mm -hmm. sort of... We actually, um, we have decided uh, recently that they were a little too businesslike. <laughs> <laughs> that ah, we so were you're really loosening them up a little bit. Yeah, we've so we've started to um, have more refreshments and sort of leave more room for the board to um, socialize either before or after the meeting. And then we also have a uh, board retreat. Um, and uh, it's not every year, but maybe every other year, so that the board can come together for a more extended period of time and talk more strategically mm -hmm. about the future of the organization. Elsa Flores wants to know, do you see branching out beyond where you are now? I mean, if, if in 10 years, mm -hmm. Uh, the near north side is has been gentrified. Where do you go next? So we have already started to expand uh, into the north side north line neighborhood, which is the next neighborhood yeah. to the north. And um, and I think the real question for us as an organization is, um, you know, are we going to go really big and grow exponentially, or continue sort of this this careful and and slow and growth pattern? I think that um, we are perhaps ready to really start to go big. Get really big. Yeah. So what does that mean for you if you go really big? Do you become sort of another neighborhood centers type mm -hmm. group? Well, I think that, um, you know, given the fact that there um, is so much need uh, yeah. in Houston and, and not a lot of other organizations um, filling that need for affordable housing, that, um, you know, we really could feel that na need and, um, and really uh, want to uh, go there. But it, you know, it will be a change for us and for me um, as a leader if we kind of go beyond the sort of comfortable size that we've been at for a while and and, and really blow it up. Are you the largest know? CDC in Houston? Um, you know, possibly the largest in terms of what we do. There are some uh, groups like, for example, Tejano Center for Community Concerns that has a CDC component, but they also oh. have a charter school. Yeah. So they probably have a bigger staff, yeah, yeah. but that's mostly at the charter school. And you guys have the biggest name, certainly, as a CDC. We're one of the oldest. Yeah. 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 Uh, let me get, John uh, Bogucki has a question here. He wants to know, is there, is there political opposition to affordable housing in Houston? Uh, because there seems to be a lot of luxury housing. So mm -hmm. do you find that when you're in a place like uh, the Avenue, Washington Avenue and the mm -hmm. near north side, is there opposition sometimes to the idea that you're going to do affordable housing? There can be opposition um, to affordable housing, particularly affordable apartments, um, which uh, you know sometimes get a, a really bad and, and I think unjustified uh, reputation. Um, you know, one of the things that we as an organization feel very strongly about is promoting diversity. Um, mm -hmm. As I mentioned, that's one mm -hmm. of our founding principles. And so our apartment complexes um, are always uh, serve a range of incomes, including market rate, you know, mm -hmm. people who are not low income at all. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so we think that's important. But, you know, unfortunately, a lot of people, when they hear affordable housing, they immediately think, Think of people who you know are not working and yeah. are up to no good and I don't want them in my neighborhood and so we can have uh, issues there. Wow it, it's very interesting isn't it that um, here are people moving into these neighborhoods mm -hmm. and saying hey don't do affordable housing here mm -hmm. it's sort of like uh, 
Well, I mean, the thing People that's kind of ironic is. is that it, it, in, in general, you know, especially when we're first building affordable housing in a neighborhood, that housing is um, often more expensive than the existing housing uh, that that uh, is there. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, we're charging rents of, you know, six to eight hundred dollars for an apartment. Well, that's more than the surrounding yeah. <laughs> apartments yeah. are charging. And, and it's a, a very nice uh, apartment complex. But people don't understand that. They hear that it's affordable and, and they're afraid of it. Mm -hmm. Wow. Interesting stuff. So Mari Trevino has a, a great question. She wants to know, what are the top three things that you would identify as your keys to success? Mm -hmm. Well, my keys to success, I, I hate to say it again, um, but first of all, my board uh, yeah. is, is key to the success. Second of all, uh, having a good team um, on, on a staff level. And uh, third, um, I guess I'll, I'll say uh, balance. Um, you Talk know. about that a little bit. Well, I think that, um, you know, work is one part of life, uh, but then there's the rest of life and, uh, you know. So do you have a good work-life balance? I feel like I do uh, wow. have a really good work-life uh, balance. It's very rare that a CEO mentions that, that you have a good work-life balance. Yeah. So how did you manage that? I feel that it's important, and so yeah. I have um, made sure to organize my life and uh, and our organization um, around pe being not only for myself but for the rest of the staff, yeah. being able to maintain um, a good balance uh, with uh, their their home and family life. But Mary, when you go home on the weekend, mm -hmm. aren't you thinking about the avenue the whole weekend anyway? No, you're not. <laughs> <laughs> Not every weekend. <laughs> Maybe sometimes. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So that's good that you're able to do that. I find it very hard to not be at home not thinking about work all the time. Mm -hmm. Do you have your, your iPhone uh, or your phone handy all the time? And do you check your email? So I uh, go on two-week vacations, and I do not look at my email once. Not at all? No. I tell... Uh, if it's an emergency, they can call you Exactly. Okay. I tell them to, uh, to send uh, any important information uh, to my uh, personal email account, because that I will check while I'm on vacation, mm -hmm. but I don't look at my work email. <laughs> wow. Wow. Yeah, I, that's... So that's commendable, I would have to say. That's very commendable. Um, so Rebecca Best wants to know, um, how do you keep yourself in check when you have so many responsibilities to take care of with nonprofits? I guess that's a very similar question to work-life balance. Mm -hmm. Is there a way to keep yourself sort of in check? Well, I think that um, it's important, you know, not to get too too stressed. And you know, I mean, I'm prone to stress, like like anyone, when you know there's a lot on your plate and you're getting, you know, ten emails a minute, and you don't know how you're ever going to keep up with it. Um, but um, you know, it's important to recognize that you can't do it all and you shouldn't try and do it all and that's why you have a team um, and I think you know the team that you have is so essential to having the organization succeed. Yeah. Kate uh, Gigliotti wants to know what advice do you have uh, for someone who's brand new going into a leadership position for the first time? Well, uh, be a really good listener, mm -hmm. I would say, is, is super important. Um, and, um, you know, not think that you need to know all of the answers um, mm -hmm. because you don't. Uh, so ask a lot of questions um, and, and lean on others uh, when you need to. Wow. You know, I, f I find it interesting um, that in talking to CEOs and leaders in the nonprofit world, women... Uh, leaders often talk about listening mm -hmm. and guide leaders hardly ever talk about it. Mm -hmm. I mean, do, do you notice these differences between men and women as leaders in mm -hmm. nonprofits? Um, you know, I think that I'm not surprised to hear that. Yeah. <laughs> but I think that... I, I think I've learned from that. I think I'm a better <laughs> listener having heard so many women say <laughs> it's important. I think I've learned from that. But Yeah, I mean, I think that, um, you know, inspiring people and um, making them want to really give their all to an organization, you know, requires uh, respecting them and eliciting their, their advice and, uh, and acting on it. It. And so if you're just always telling people what to do, you know, yeah. you're not going to do well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I need to stop telling people what to do. 
Uh, who was your mentor? Jonathan, Jonathan Holland wants to know, this is a good question. Uh, who was your mentor and how have they, was or is your mentor, how, how have they shaped your leadership style? Mm -hmm. Well, I think um, in terms of uh, affordable housing um, here in Houston, uh, Steve Fairfield uh, yeah. from uh, Covenant Community Capital, um, you know, he really um, is a great person and uh, a very caring person and really knowledgeable and capable person. So I would say um, that he uh, certainly um, is somebody that I look up to in the field. And, uh, you know, one of the things uh, that I will say is, you know, generosity and uh, helping others, uh, other organizations, um, which, you know, sometimes you feel like you're in competition with other nonprofits. Mm -hmm. um, for resources or for good staff or uh, whatever, but um, you know, it, it really uh, strengthens everybody when you work together and, and, and share. <laughs> yeah, that's sort of an important leadership lesson, isn't it, as mm -hmm. well for nonprofits, is that uh, I, will, I will talk to new people in the nonprofit world and they will say, well, you guys seem very collaborative, but it almost seems like the better leaders are even more collaborative, right? Mm -hmm. I, I mean, uh, I find, you know, you and other nonprofit leaders sort of bending over backwards to be mm -hmm. collaborative. How can we collaborate? Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it's sort of nice, right, when you when you run into leaders like that. Yeah, I think so. And I think collaboration in the nonprofit field has has improved uh, yeah. while I've been in it. So I think that. Um, you know, we always talked about collaboration. I think we're actually doing it a lot more now, mm -hmm. and I think we're really, you know, enjoying what the benefits are um, mm -hmm. of working together. Wow. Are you still building that little nonprofit center up in the near north side? Yes. With, with, for nonprofits? Yeah. So that even more collaboration could happen there. Exactly. Right? Yeah. Um, Michelle Cordier wants to know about conflicts mm -hmm. uh, and a leader. How do you handle conflict within your organization? Mm -hmm. Well, there's always going to be conflict, um, and um, you know I think that uh, it's important to sort of identify what's what's really causing it because it's not always what it might seem to be on the surface. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, finding those root causes and uh, seeing if you can um, deal with with those as opposed to the surface tension that might be um, showing up. It it's always hard, though, isn't it, whenever you have that, mm -hmm. that conflict going on? But it can really, you know, it can really erode an organization Absolutely. if you let it uh, persist. Um, what is your, I think I asked this last week, but what is your strategy if you have an employee who is a superstar mm -hmm. but uh, is poisoned, toxic within the organization in terms of mm -hmm. putting everyone in a bad mood? What do you do with someone like that? <laughs> You know what I mean? You, yeah. You've had those people, right? Yeah. I mean, we've we've had, uh, you know, one particular situation where there was a toxic environment um, and we, uh, you know, we had to end it. I mean, we had to um, have some people depart because it just, um, you know, was so bad uh, for the whole organization. Mm. Um, and, you know, so, uh, you know, sometimes you just can't fix things. Yeah. And then they complain about you online, right? That's what I, <laughs> that's what I have found. Uh, uh, after 20 years at Avenue CDC, almost 20 years, how do you keep it fresh? Mm -hmm. I mean, what is it that you're doing that sort of makes it interesting each and every day? Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, first of all, our... Um We've evolved over time. So when we first started out, uh, when I first started there, we were, you know, renovating one house at a time. Now we're building a subdivision of 95 houses. Um, we are uh, building, this year we'll have three apartment complexes under construction at once. Um, mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, that's a little nerve-wracking, but exciting, too. Yeah. 
Um, the other thing we're doing is um, this very collaborative community building effort um, where uh, Avenue CDC is acting as a convening agency um, in the neighborhood, so coordinating the efforts of residents and other nonprofit organizations on this overall improvement in the Northside uh, community. And uh, we've actually been at it for about five years now and have seen just tremendous results. I mean, uh, you know, a huge number of volunteers and uh, projects and investment in the neighborhood, um, and, and that's really powerful. And that's kind of new for us. Um, yeah. I mean, it's been five years, but in, you know, my time in the organization, this is kind of a new and exciting thing and is allowing us to touch the neighborhood in ways that we haven't before, um, and it's been really interesting. Mm -hmm. We, we've talked a little bit about it, in, you and I off camera, this, the idea of the importance of education in some of these neighborhoods. You know, as a, as a community center, as a neighborhood center, mm -hmm. you guys have quite a bit of influence. Mm -hmm. Have you ever gone to superintendents and say, mm -hmm. you know, we, we really need to see some change in the school. We mm -hmm. need to see a new principal mm -hmm. or, you know, we know these are things that you should do mm -hmm. uh, that work in neighborhoods like this and it's not happening at our school. Have mm -hmm. you ever done anything like that? So what we believe is that it's really the residents who uh, need to yeah. uh, be playing that role. And so what we've been doing is working uh, with residents to develop residential leadership. Mm. So um, training uh, resident leaders on how to negotiate with people of authority, how yeah. to go to the school board meeting and, and stand up for what you need, or even your principal and saying you know what you need. Um, and so we've gotten a really good uh, level of participation in that. And, uh, you know, one of the uh, recent um, things that's come out of that is that our local high school, the Davis High School, had mm -hmm. been scheduled uh, under the bond for a complete um, reconstruction. And uh, when the residents were being told that uh, it was being scaled back into um, something much more modest, right. you know, they stood up Good. and said, we want what we were promised. And you helped the residents sort of formulate them. These, you know, these are residents who have been uh, working um, with our program for about five years. Mm -hmm. So they are uh, seasoned leaders yeah. at this point. Wow. Uh, Ashley Lawson wants to know, and this is uh, related to this, how important is the voice of the, sort of the five members of your board that are from the community, if you will? Mm -hmm. uh, how important is that for you? And does it make it easier or more difficult? Mm -hmm. I, I think it makes it easier yeah, um, because those are the board members who really have their uh, pulse on the neighborhood and um, and can really speak to um, you know what some of the desires and, and interests are um, in the community. But we also um, go beyond the input of those uh, people to soliciting wider input uh, from the community on how our programs should be run and, and evolve. And so we do an annual survey in our community to uh, sort of elicit input from residents. Uh, Mehmet Akumas uh, on that wants to know, have you ever had a conflict with your board? Have, have you yourself ever had a conflict with the board? I have. I oh, have, have had a, a conflict, um, which um, I would say was uh, not with the whole board. And, and the board uh, ultimately ended up supporting um, me uh, and, in, and my leadership of the organization. Um, but but uh, yes, those can be uncomfortable times. Yeah. Talk, can you talk a little bit more? How, how does that work? How, when you have a conflict with the board, how do mm -hmm. you deal with it? So I think, um, you know, first of all, communication is key. And, um, and part of uh, the difficulty, I think, was, um, you know, a couple of board members who were uncomfortable with um, what uh, the direction uh, was, was and um, uncomfortable with um, the management. Yeah. And uh, really, it was a matter of sort of uh, communicating and, and having the other board members communicate that know this was the, the direction and, and that the, um, the management was there. Yeah. Every once in a while you find board members that feel like they want to run the organization too. Mm -hmm. Have you had, have you run into that? You know, it, 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 it did cross my mind whether that was <laughs> going on. 
<laughs> we have one board member who everyone says, if you ever leave Bob, you know, he really wants your job, you know, <laughs> great. Um, um, Jordan Klein, the most gratifying part for you uh, in terms of leading the Avenue CDC, what is it for you? Mm -hmm. You know, I really think it is, you know, what we can see happening in the community right now. Um, I came from a community meeting today. Um, we met over lunch. We were talking about uh, the next uh, plan for the neighborhood and just sort of the level of excitement in the room about not only what we had accomplished, but where we were going to take it next is, is very gratifying. Yeah. And, and you're probably, you know, you probably have a lot of gratifying moments. I mean, I feel mm -hmm. like I've, it, sometimes we don't always appreciate them, right? But mm -hmm. there are a lot of gratifying moments. Do you find that? Yeah, I would say if I was going to fault myself uh, for um, my, uh, the way that I, I live my life at work is that sometimes I don't always stop to smell the roses yeah. and appreciate what, uh, what we've accomplished. Um, so one example, we, we uh, recently closed on the financing for um, uh, one of our apartment complexes, and it was... Um, really, you know, it's a lot of hard work, a lot of legal documents, a lot of back and forth with the lenders, long hours to get it done, and we got it done, and I was, you know, my stress level was fairly high, high and, you know, signed all the final papers and pushed it aside and then thought, okay, now I need to work on this other really important project, and I started getting into it, and then I realized, what are you, crazy? <laughs> <laughs> So I actually went out and, and uh, bought a, a gift for the staff person oh. who had been the lead on that project, and that made me feel better. Was giving him a what little a token thing, of yeah. you know the the celebration of, of what we had accomplished. I also feel like as as we grow, we sometimes don't celebrate. You know, we we received this week a gift of seventy thousand dollars, and I'm mm -hmm. like, oh hey, we got seventy thousand. And I just remember, you know, a couple of years we would all have been like, wow. Yeah, you know, <laughs> but it's just an average gift, and I feel like we need to keep keep doing those things. So. Right. Uh, 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 Denise Steele wants to know about choosing the nonprofits you collaborate with. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I find a lot of nonprofits want are very good collaborators. Mm -hmm. There's still a couple that don't seem to play well with others. Mm -hmm. you know, everyone knows who they are. Mm -hmm. How do you choose who you're going to work with? Well, you get to know them, you get to know the leadership, and you figure out what exactly that collaboration is going to look like. Because, mm -hmm. you know, it's pretty important to have sort of defined uh, roles and responsibilities and, and what is the, the joint outcome that we're uh, supposed to be uh, working together on. Mm -hmm. So I think that's important. Yeah. Getting to know them a little bit is sort of a, a good thing. Um, so Renee Brooks wants to know, how do you address political types, uh, the probably should be you know, political types, who don't see low-income people or original residents as benefiting from gentrification? Similar to another question we've had, I guess. Mm -hmm. But is there a lot of, do you see a lot of sort of politics in the work you do? You know, there's certainly, um, as I said, there are some who are just opposed to affordable apartments, no matter what, um, you know, including elected officials who have, you know, clearly stated, I will never, ever support uh, this kind of development. So, um, you know, that's, that's a real challenge uh, for us uh, when somebody has staked out that kind of position. We try and show them what we do. Yeah. I mean, actually take them to see our work in order to have them understand that, you know, this is not going to be a bad thing for the neighborhood. It's going to be a good thing for the neighborhood. Uh, we show them data. I mean, data shows, you know, serious academic studies show that putting affordable housing in a neighborhood does not drag down the property values of right. the single family houses nearby. In fact, it uh, t tends it to helps. raise them yeah. up. So, um, so that's really, we try and uh, deal in facts, <laughs> facts and, and evidence. But not everyone. Uh, it doesn't always yeah, work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, everyone's, what was it, Daniel Moynihan who said, everyone has the right to their own opinion, but you know, no one has the right to their own facts. Right? Yeah. Facts, facts, yeah. Um, let me do one last question before we go to our final questions. Uh, Carl Adams wants to know, um, what type of fundraising uh, do you do for the organization? Talk mm -hmm. about sort of the different types of fundraising that you're engaged in, Mary. Okay, so 
Um, you know, there are a number of funding sources that we rely on. Uh, one are private foundations. Um, so, you know, the Houston Endowment, for yep. example, the biggest uh, foundation in town and maybe and the country, the state. The state. Okay, at yeah. least the state. Yep. Um, so, um, so we do uh, apply to the Houston Endowment and that involves, you know, writing a proposal describing, you know, our programs and what we hope to do with the money. Um, we get funds from uh, several government sources, uh, which is a whole different kind of animal yeah. um, in terms of the fundraising. We get um, not so much funding from individuals, mm -hmm. um, although we do have an annual fundraising event, uh, which is where most of our individual uh, funds come come through, and that's one of the great fun events in town. I thank you, think, yeah. thank you. Yes, yeah. it's a it's a longstanding event. It's a, a silent auction of uh, artwork uh, from. We have about 250 artists, uh, mostly from the community, who contribute artwork uh, to the event and we actually share the proceeds of the sale of the work uh, with the artist so it's helping our local artists as, as, as well as helping can I them. wrangle a few f uh, free invitations for class members of for, course for, okay, yes very good. we'll do that then yeah, yeah very good uh, let me ask some some fun questions as we finish up your favorite restaurant in Houston I really like Shade in the Heights, oh, yeah. 19th Street in the Heights. It's an oldie but goodie. Yeah, it's been around. What's that really? Do they do like a green uh, tomato, fried tomato sandwich? They of some do, sort? fried it's tomato sandwich. And they used to have a little trio of soups that I really liked. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. She's a good chef. Uh, Claire Smith is the chef there. She's fantastic. Yeah. Um, is there a secret venue in town or a little place of town that not many people know about uh -huh. that's sort of like you feel like it's a little wonderful piece of Houston? You know, I, I wouldn't say it's a secret. I'm really enjoying the bike trails, and they're getting better all the time. Yeah, more and so, more people. So, um, you yeah. know, I can ride my bike right down here and back to yeah. my home again. Did you ride to, to I, your Not tonight, tonight, no. no. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, and when... Uh, when they do a movie about Mary Lawler in Hollywood, you know, the, uh -huh. the Mary Lawler story. Remember when they used to make movies like that? Yeah. Uh, who, who would play you in the movies? Well, I hope it's going to be Meryl Streep. Because <laughs> <laughs> she does everyone pretty well, no yeah. matter what, right? So that's, uh, that's very good. And then do you have a leadership idol, Mary? You know, um, I uh, am a huge fan of President Obama. Mm -hmm. um, I uh, The Pope is here right now, and uh, so I am really loving uh, what he is doing with the Catholic Church. So this would be totally up there. I love, uh, I, I checked my Facebook right before I came, I came up, and there was someone had posted a picture of uh, the president with the Pope yesterday and them mm -hmm. both laughing mm -hmm. together. I just love that picture. Yeah. It was just sort of wonderful. Mary, you do such wonderful work in town. Thank you very much mm -hmm. for sharing that with this class. Thank you for your leadership. Mm -hmm. uh, um, it's, it's a real honor to have you here. Thank you well, so much. Well, thank for being you. Here. Yes, very good. Hey, we will see you guys next time, next week here in the Leadership Studio. Until then, uh, keep up the great work.